Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be looking at decay and decomposition for your GCSE biology. Now it may sound a little bit gross but there are lots of interesting science that links here into lots of different things. So we can link back to the nutrient cycles, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle. This links lots of different things together. Hi everyone, so we're going to be looking at decay and decomposition today. So decomposition is the process by which dead organisms or waste products are broken down into smaller molecules including carbon dioxide, sugars, amino acids and minerals, which are just some examples. Now that's the actual breakdown, so decomposition is the actual breakdown of the dead matter. Decay is another word that we're going to use it in this presentation. It's kind of um, used alongside instead of decomposition as well. But it's the word we use to kind of describe the process of decomposition because it means to deteriorate or to get worse or to decline in quality. So if something is decaying, it is decomposing, it is breaking down. And decay is often used to describe the stages of decomposition composition so actively decaying slow decay though it's kind of a word used as a description but the decomposition part is the actual chemical breakdown of waste and dead matter into smaller molecules by enzymes so this picture here is of some food waste and it is decomposing or sometimes you'll see the word rotting so to rot to decay to decompose that's what those words mean here decomposers are the organisms that do the decomposing. They break down the dead tissue or the waste using enzymes. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Examples are fungi and bacteria, and this is how they get their nutrients. This is how they feed. They use enzymes, they break down the food, and they're going to absorb it. So this is their nutrition by breaking down dead material. So this is going to include a little bit of a recap of some of the um, topics about enzymes that we will have done already. So decomposers use enzymes to break down the dead matter and waste into smaller molecules that they it will dissolve in water and they can absorb those in through their cells and some of them they'll absorb, they won't absorb all of them, so the rest get released into the soil or water or the surrounding environment for plants to then take up and use, which means they go back into the start of the food chain. So looking at some examples of large molecules that get broken down, remember we've got carbohydrates, we've got proteins, and we've got lipids, otherwise known as fats. These are our large molecules. These are the, the bigger molecules that, that are in cells and in matter that make it up. And they get broken down into the small molecules, which are small enough to then be absorbed through cell membranes, cell walls. So carbohydrates get broken down into sugars, obviously main example is starch going to glucose, proteins get broken down into amino acids, and then lipids get broken down into two things, fatty acids and glycerol. Now for each of these I've obviously circled the small unit, the small part that are joined together to make up these larger molecules, and in fats that is that they have the three fatty acid chains and then they have a glycerol. So that's where we break those bonds, so we get those two molecules. So remember enzymes, bind to their substrate, the, the substrate binds to the active site and it helps to break down the molecules or make them, but in this case, break them down because they are catalysts. So they're just speeding up that chemical reaction, which is breaking down the substrate. So as an example here, I've got a video of this milk that is decomposing. So it's decomposing or it's going off because the bacteria that are in it are releasing enzymes to digest the lactose sugars that are in the milk, and then they are absorbing them. And then the milk tastes sour because this process produces lactic acid. You can see that the white kind of substance is disappearing, and you get this kind of clear liquid left over. And if you've ever left milk in the fridge for a long time and it goes off you can sometimes see that it separates out into it and that's because the bacteria that are inside it because there's bacteria pretty much in everything especially organic food substances if given enough time or being allowed to be active enough I'm going to talk about this in a minute they will start using enzymes 
to digest the nutrients in the milk, for example, the sugars. And in this case, it produces the lactic acid. This is obviously a very sped up video. You're seeing it in a time lapse. So it's happened over a long time, but it has been sped up for you here. So you can see how the decay looks. OK, so the rate of decay, anything about rate has to do with time. So the rate of decay is the speed at which the dead matter gets broken down by a decomposer. And it's affected by three main factors. So the first one is temperature. So at cold temperatures, decomposers are less active. They've been slowed down. So the rate of decay is going to be slower. This is why we keep food in the fridge uh, or even the freezer to make it last longer. So at those cold temperatures, the bacteria are less active. So it takes a lot longer for them to um, start actually decomposing it. Things and food and even milk does go off in the fridge if you leave it for long enough. So cooling it down slows down that process so the food lasts for longer. If you put it in the freezer because it's a much colder temperature, it takes even longer and most bacteria can't survive at those extremely cold temperatures of a freezer. As temperature increases, decomposers are going to become more active because they're going to have more energy. So the rate of decay starts to increase. Um, just because reactions happen faster at higher temperatures, they'll start being able to respire faster and therefore they'll be able to grow, divide and carry out their um, enzyme reactions faster. But similar to things like enzymes and for the reasons of enzymes, at extremely high temperatures, so if we steam clean something, if we cook something at high temperatures, all decomposers are killed and so therefore decay will stop. Next one is water. So the next factor that affects the rate of decay is water. If there's little to no water, decomposers basically just can't survive and so there's no decay. Like all organisms, they need water to survive. And so as the amount of water increases, so does the rate of decay. Many decomposers are going to need to absorb nutrients that are dissolved in the water. So they secrete the enzymes, the enzymes break down the nutrients into the small molecules, and then they need those small molecules to dissolve in water to be able to then absorb them. So the more water it is, the more they're able to do that. So processes like mummification of bodies that was done in Egypt and drying out meat and fish, things like biltong, things like dried fish, they help to prevent decomposition and preserve those tissues for quite a long time. So that's why it's sort of safe to eat those, those dried meats. They're not in the fridge, they're still meat, but they're safe because they've been dried out. And lastly, the last factor is oxygen. So oxygen is needed by many decomposers in order to respire. And therefore, if they can respire, they can get energy in order to grow and divide and reproduce. So as more oxygen is available, the rate of decay increases because they can do more respiration to get more energy and therefore carry out more um, decomposition. That's why we try to seal food in airtight bags or tins or containers if we're storing it in the fridge, because the, the less air, the less oxygen you can give them, the better. Fossils. So when we looked at fossils, we talked about insects trapped in amber or things trapped in ice, organisms that have fallen into peat bogs where there's not enough oxygen for decay to occur. So those organisms have been preserved for a really long time, sometimes even millions of years. But that doesn't mean no decomposers can survive without oxygen. There are some that can respire anaerobically and still survive. So this is for many of them, but not all decomposers. But if you increase the amount of oxygen, you're going to increase the rate of decay most of the time. So speaking of anaerobic decay, um, some microorganisms, as we just said, some decomposers can survive and live anaerobically when they do this and when they are decomposers and they break down the organic matter without oxygen it's called anaerobic decay there are some natural examples where this happens waterlogged soils so if soils have um, become too wet uh, or they are there's a flood anything where like a uh, mud a in a couple of layers of mud at the bottom of a lake or a marsh kind of boggy environment and also in biogas generators. But those first few are kind of natural examples where water has kind of covered a soil or some mud and therefore there's no air being able to get in there. And that waterlogged environment creates a lack of oxygen, which means that you've got anaerobic conditions. When decomposers break down dead matter anaerobic 
directly, they produce the gases methane and carbon dioxide. These are both greenhouse gases. This will be important later. When they're mixed together, they can be burned as a fuel. We call that fuel biogas, and this is a renewable energy resource. Biogas generators are used where animal waste or sometimes crops that we've specifically grown to do this are digested anaerobically using microorganisms in those big kind of containers. They're very large, so they'd be, there'd be a lot of matter in there and some microorganisms and they'd be left to decompose it, but it'd be sealed so there's no oxygen in there. And then the rest of the buildings are kind of obviously to take off the gas that's being produced, collect it, potentially store it, but then pipe it or pump it or transport it in um, lorries, containers, to homes because it can be used as a fuel to heat things. It can be burned and used in that way, just like gas if you have a gas boiler and things at home. We can carry out this process with food waste. So green waste, whether it's from the garden or from the kitchen, that's collected from home, so plant waste, food waste, it can be used and then this reduces how much of that waste goes to landfill where it would just be dumped on the ground in a big pile because this is also helpful because if it goes to landfill it's in that big pile and it's not in a generator the gases would just be the methane and the carbon dioxide would just be released into the atmosphere and so therefore they contribute to global warming but if we're trapping the gases and then burning them then that's slightly better because we're using them rather than just letting them in increase uh, global warming by being released to the atmosphere. So another way that this kind of plant waste or animal waste can be used is by farmers and gardeners. So there are two types here. We're talking about manure, which is any waste that has come from animals. It can be from cows that are on the farm or animals that are on the farm and the farmer can take them and use the manure for his fields. Or it could be from other animals or even from waste from chickens or things that you've got at home. And then compost is made from plants that have started to decompose. So we start piling them up outside to make a compost heap. You might do this at home in your garden or you, you have to put your grass cuttings in and bits of plants, but also potentially food waste and things like that. And eventually it starts to decompose and break down and forms kind of soil like material that looks like compost. So gardeners and farmers use both compost and manure to fertilise, which just means to add nutrients to their soil, which in turn is going to help their plants to grow. This is important and they need to do this because when farmers grow crops, they harvest them, which means they cut them down and they remove them from the soil. So all the nutrients that the plants absorbed from the soil in order to grow haven't been replaced because those plants did not die and then decompose there, which is what would normally happen. So you took that plant material away in order to sell it or to eat it, whatever. And so then that soil is left bare and there's no plants there to decompose or break down and put the nutrients back like a nutrient cycle would. But by spreading this manure or this compost onto the soil once the plants have been harvested and then leaving it to be broken down by uh, decomposers and decay, then the mineral ions and all of the small molecules, useful molecules, will then be released back into the soil, ready to be used by the next plants that are grown in that field, which makes it a bit more of a natural process, but also means that there will be enough minerals and nutrients there for the plants to grow properly. Often this spreading of this um, sort of decaying material or manure is done by a plough, which churns up and digs it into the soil. That also helps to aerate the soil, which means to put air into it. So the decomposers have plenty of oxygen. It helps speed up that process, but also it helps water to drain away as well and just generally improves the soil ready for plants to come and grow in it. The most important mineral that this tends to add is nitrogen, which is something that plants really need and need to get from the soil. And we'll go through a bit more in detail about how that happens in the nitrogen cycle video, if you need it. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.